thanks everyone for joining in to this uh, third episode, I think, on talking about intersectionality and, and demystifying it. Really glad to be joined by Professor Fiona Kamari Campbell, who is a recognised interdisciplinary scholar and activist, and is currently Professor of Disability and Ableism Studies at the School of Education and Social Work at the University of Dundee. Um, she comes from a non-traditional back academic background and has a, such a array of intersectional experience that, that can talk both personally and professionally. So really excited to be having this conversation with you today, Fiona. Um, I'll, I'll pause there to, to allow you to introduce yourself as well. Hi, this is Fiona, Fiona Kamari. Uh, yeah, it's absolutely fantastic to be able to, you know, be in conversation about um, intersectionality and, you know, minoritised lives. Um, and I'm sure we'll probably cover a lot of areas. That's great, thank you. So it'd be great to hear a little bit about your background on, on your kind of staff profile. You, you identify it in, in a lot of different ways and it'd be great to hear about your kind of history, about who you are as well, and kind of maybe what brought you to this area of research perhaps in some ways or this area of study that you've, you've been leading. Okay, um, well, uh, so in terms of my background, um, I have never been normal, whatever that means. <laughs> and definitely not be, have never been mainstream. And I'm hoping um, when I come back for a uh, second life, uh, I will experience this uh, delightful state because um, uh, I have no idea what it's like to be uh, uh, in a kind of majoritarian and uh, 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 reality, um, it's 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 like a strange uh, species. Um, so, in terms of my involvement in intersectionality, I mean, I guess I really didn't have a choice. Uh, uh, you know, I was born into. So, let me tell you about my background and the different areas. So, uh, my I was born in Australia, and um, uh, my mother is um, Sri Lankan, and my father is uh, Scottish and um, they met in Australia as part of the Australian immigration. Although my mother came in to Australia at a time that the white Australia policy um, existed. And that's another whole story where basically you had to provide the government um, with a genealogy to prove that you were, um, and they, they changed the guidelines, but it was like 50% European extraction and then 75% and, then when they were getting too many dark folks coming in under that, they then um, had to add some other uh, other criteria. So, so probably from the earliest stages of my life, and we're talking about the 1960s, uh, because the white Australia policy actually didn't end till 1972, officially at least, um, uh, race was um, at the centre of uh, my family experience um, in terms of growing up. And I will say that, for me, the biggest uh, thread, even now, uh, many, many um, decades later, uh, the, the central, I guess, problematic in my life has been the fact that I am white appearing. Uh, and uh, I am the whitest person in my family. Uh, and it's been such a stigma. Um, and some people might be shocked uh, at this idea for me that I'm saying my whiteness is stigmatizing, uh, but it is, uh, because um, when I was growing up, it was kind of like celebrated. Oh, look, you've got someone who's super white in the family. And, you know, uh, my mother used to show me off um, uh, until another whiter person came along, by the way. She had blue eyes, so I was uh, dethroned. Um, but I think the other issue for me, why I say stigma, is the issue of legitimacy. So, and, and this is not just within the mainstream community, even within my Sri Lankan community, uh, not that everybody, not, as, not that anybody has been explicit, but I know what they're thinking. They're thinking, who the hell are you? Are you really Sri Lankan or are you one of these colonial imposters? Um, and so there is this kind of le legitimacy of proof and, uh, you know, that endures. And then on the other side, I get, uh, you know, white folk saying, well, look, you look white. Why don't you just pass? Uh, why do you have to keep uh, emphasising your Asian um, side to yourself? I mean, I am biracial or mixed race, and there's all sorts of terms that we can use. 
the good, bad and the ugly. But I mean, I am a joining of two uh, cultural backgrounds. And so, the, so that's what people keep saying to me, uh, you know, why, why you can pass, why you <coughs> keep uh, overemphasizing uh, your Asian-ness. Well, I mean, the first response to that is, well, there's two responses to that is one, those of us who uh, are from minority cultures, we do have to overemphasize, otherwise we get lost in the sea of the dominant culture for a start. Um, um, and in my case, uh, the second point is that actually I was culturally raised as Sri Lankan. So, <laughs> so uh, my father died when I was nine. So, so in fact, uh, despite the white appearance, the lens of my experience, the way that I see the world and the cognitive ways of processing things, the moral and ethical values that I have, um, for better or worse, are Sri Lankan. And I say better or worse because I'm also critical of Sri Lankan cultural <laughs> values as well. So that's one aspect of it. And there's, that's it's always an ongoing issue, like who let the white girl in? And that's even with BAME uh, communities too. There is colorism within the BAME community, um, absolutely. And you see this often coming yeah. out, for example, even with the Black Lives Matter issue is, well, where do we fit Asians into that? And now obviously we have the rise of anti uh, anti-Chinese violence. Um, so there, there are tension points where, you know, heterogeneous groups of people are being thrown together. Um, the other uh, um, aspect of intersectionality is um, I'm lesbian and I came out as lesbian when I was 16, um, which was a long time ago. Um, and that's my normal. I've never been anything else. Um, you know, obviously, Probably the changes are in uh, society's attitudes towards, and I'll use the old fashioned term, homosexuality. So when I came out, bar still being raided by police and, you know, women lost their children for being um, lesbian. Um, so, you know, I guess I'm probably one of the old, older generation in terms of my approach. I, I, I will happily admit I kind of, um, get a rash every time I hear the word queer because it's got such associations for me uh, mm -hmm. with that. And I know that's quite common for those of us who've come from that generation because it was seen as such a dreadful term. Um, you know, and it kind of gets in your bones. Um, I'm also, uh, I have a number of disabilities. And again, I'm at home with that. So uh, when I was 18, I um, developed a virus and uh, acquired a spinal cord injury. So I've been using a wheelchair uh, on and off since then. Um, that's my normative reality now. I can't remember. It was such a long time ago. Um, I'm autistic as, as as well, and I have dyscalculia, which is kind of like the poorer cousin of dyslexia. In other words, um, people who are dyscalculic, um, bloody hard word to say, I tell you, um, um, have problems with numbers and distance and and things like that. Um, and and I have. Uh, post-traumatic stress disorder uh, 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 as well. Um, and the other one and is a, also, I come from a, um, a Jewish and a Buddhist background, so minority um, religious. Um, and you know, it seems strange um, uh, around just kind of like listing them because one of the dilemmas with this stuff is it's like a shopping list of diversity. And um, I think one of the challenges I have with um, how diversity is approached in the UK and in Australia is, it's silos, you know, it's, um, and I have this vision, I wish I was a cartoonist, because I would be running from one room to the other to go to the different group meetings. Um, and I don't think uh, there is much awareness really about the fact that actually, I think quite a lot of us fit into those multiple categories. Now, we call that, some people call that intersectionality, but it's, um, Anyway, we can talk about that, how that model's understood and how people with multiple forms of marginality, how they how that happens in their life. But um, um, probably the only other thing I want to say before you ask a question <laughs> is in terms of work, um, I'm an accidental academic. Um, I um, am pretty much self-taught. I left school when I was 15 and um, um, education's been really for the wealthy. Um, so I kind of did my studies over a period of time. And um, I, I worked in the community sector on poverty alleviation projects and, you know, disability projects. 
Um, and then I spent a little bit of time in the civil service um, at a time when it was great to be a civil servant because we were introducing a new way of funding disability services. We're, they actually hired activists, which is pretty amazing. Um, and then I was asked in 1995, I was asked to do a guest lecture on a topic that I didn't particularly like, and um, but I knew a lot about. Um, and I said, yes, I'll do that as long as you can give me equal time to critique it. And, um, and then I fell into academia pretty much from that point. I, 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 um, I got a scholarship to do my honours. It was the first time I'd ever studied full time. And um, I got first class honours and then I got a scholarship to do a PhD and the rest is history, really. So, so I'm really not one of the traditional kind of silver spoon people um, in education. So I've got to watch swearing too much. That's one of the things I get caught out. Being Australian and also being a bit of a, a rough nut from a rough nut background, I always have to clean up the language somewhat. Uh, it's incredible. I mean, uh, I think it's, just, it's so, you talk about the, the identities as sort of, a, sort of a, the shopping list metaphor, and sometimes it can feel that way when we're talking about, particularly around this issue around competing inequality sometimes. Um, something I've come across recently is and that way intersectionality is sometimes referred to as sort of the simultaneity of oppressions or the way in which they run parallel with one another. And it seems like you've, from what you've described, you've, you've been at this sort of push and pull between uh, different oppressions or different inequalities or different inequalities as, and throughout your experiences and, and life as well. But you did also talk about that dissonance between being, I guess some people refer to it as white passing, don't they, in, in the BAME community, but growing up with the Sri Lankan like sort of cultural values. Just out of curiosity, do, do you still kind of hold those Sri Lankan cultures and values and norms to, you know, have they shaped your, your experiences quite significantly? Mm -hmm. um, particularly thinking about um, uh, the lesbian identity as well, and definitely something <laughs> that I've, I've experienced being gay and South Asian in some ways that push and pull doesn't fit right, you know. So I just wondered if that's something that's been a tension, I guess, in some ways for you yeah, uh, in, in, yeah. in your life and also maybe the, the, the work you do. Um, I think that's a, you know, that's a really good um, question. I think, you know, for me, how would I characterize my relationship to Sri Lankan culture and Western culture? Because I am a product of the West, you know, I was born in Australia and educated and that's a, that is a fact. And I've, you know, I've got privileges because of that. Um, well, you know, I would characterize that tension in terms of ab ambivalence, right? Uh, and, um, and, and uh, you know, it goes up and down and I, you know, again, I'm fairly blunt. So I, I, I will be quite blunt in my responses. You know, some days I think, Bloody hell, I don't want to, I don't want to have any more contact with, uh, you know, Sri Lankan colleagues and Sri Lankan research because I do Sri Lankan research, you know, I don't want to go to the country um, and it pisses me off for a while and then, and then I kind of like, actually I feel most at home in Sri Lanka, this is the irony, and I hold a post there and, you know, like, uh, when I first went to Sri Lanka in 1989, like, it, you know, it was a spiritual moment because I felt like I'd come home. And, uh, you know, I know sometimes the cultural cynics say, well, that's probably constructed in terms of your identity and all that. But it was more than that. Well, I can remember uh, touching the soil and certain, even though at that stage I didn't know the language because my mother chose not to um, teach the language to me, Sinhala, um, I, I, I felt at peace and it was like a coming together. Um, the, the nearest I can explain it to is for people, for example, who've been adopted when they meet their um uh, their family of uh, their biological family, so it goes up and down. So I think the one thing I want to say to you, and and is the question you you raised is just so important. Um, there is no question that I have been shaped and formed by uh, Sri Lankan culture and values, and 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 we and uh, I'm not seeing them as a uh, homogeneous, by the way, but because there's all sorts of tensions. I mean, my mother was a product of the colonial. Uh, apparatus you know so everything was filtered through her colonial experience anyway but, but obviously now I mean and Sri Lanka has changed it's a living culture um so I have been shaped and formed by that and 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 I think it's important for people to realize when we say this it, it goes deep 
it becomes naturalized you know it's it's and and, and um it's 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 just the way you perceive things you know it's it's as silly as the debate that i have with my daughter about whether something is blue or green <laughs> you know there's been research done on this on how people from different cultural backgrounds actually see color differently right so it's not my area but it is it is an ongoing argument in my household right but what i can do and and particularly with my research uh, as well so I, what are the areas of tension points? Well, one of the problems with Sri Lanka and like most South Asian nations, and I will generalise here as well, is it's, it, it is a very patriarchal, misogynistic culture, right? Um, and, and how does that happen? It happens basically that you see men on the street and women are in their homes, right? That is a visual experience. It's changing, but... Um, you know, that is the dominant experience. And um, I mean, Sri Lanka is a traditional culture, but it's probably not as traditional as some of the other South Asian countries, right? It's had that kind of uh, cross fertilization of people coming and going uh, from different places. Uh, the main uh, role of women is to be married and have children. Um, and uh, I have a child, which is a godsend for in the Sri Lankan, because I've got a before child and after child experience of dealing with Sri Lanka. Um, and, uh, but I'm not married, so that puts a bloody spanner in the works. Uh, um, I know when I went to work in Sri Lanka the first time, and I mean, I don't think the people will see this video now, but I lied. I lied to the dean. Where's your husband? I said, he died in a car accident. Um, it was just easier to say than kind of, um, you know, this is in 2007 go through the kind of uh, convoluted reasons why I didn't have a husband to say nothing about even the birth of my daughter because she was um, donor conceived. <laughs> so, and at that time that didn't happen. Um, so I think, you know, and it's very hard to for women to work on their own. And actually for me, it's very interesting. I was prepared to take the status drop and I wanted to actually, this is 2007, 2008, work in Sri Lanka. I actually wanted to work in the university system there because I felt it was important, particularly after the war, to uh, uplift and develop universities, you know, because Sri Lanka is very behind compared to India. So when we talk about post-colonial knowledges, well, uh, um, I mean, the university system was in a total mess. Uh, but, you know, to cut a long story short, you know, my friends, my Sri Lankan friends said to me, look, it will be very difficult for you as a, a woman on your living on your own with a child in Sri Lanka. It could actually even be uh, dangerous. So that that I mean, that is the reality. I mean, um, so you and, and also when you've got a child, you're not just thinking about yourself. It's about the child as well. Um, so I, and, and then the other issue about critique of culture, I guess, is. You know, I, th I think so I, the ambivalence is I'm doing two things in my research. One is um, I believe I'm, I'm, I'm engaged in what I call uh, post-Western sociology or post-Western uh, social theory, uh, which is about using uh, intellectual traditions from the global south and in particular South Asia and Southeast Asia um, and that can actually uh, be contributions to uh, um, solving the problem of human suffering and and hu and humanization, yeah, and and uh, and there are some amazing uh, uh, traditions that are there, um, including the Indian tradition of what they call the four point argumentation. In other words, things are not just right or wrong. You can actually uh, hold four simultaneous truths to be correct at the same time, which kind of when I discuss this with students, it blows their mind. You know. Um, and so, so there are some very uh, strong, recently I looked at uh, Indian philosophy's co uh, contribution to um, inclusion ethics, uh, and I just dipped my, my feet in, but um, I looked at that. But then you get the horrors of like the caste system, which I, um, for example, uh, I'm using now for my work around ableism, uh, because I'm seeing it as a prototype for a, 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 a ranked, uh, form of, uh, of dehumanization um, and and you know there are I think I sent you a paper I've been looking at the role of mothers who have children with disabilities and the ethic which is in India as well it's called La Jabaya which is a shame fear ethic um, 
and some of these cultural traditions can be quite difficult. I mean, I'm interested in how people get around them. Um, I mean, I think the hardest thing with the ambivalence and, and yeah, it works, it cuts both ways is, and we have this joke among my friends, you know, in Sri Lanka, everybody's your uncle or auntie. Seriously, you can't get any peace. There are always people spying on you. Um, gossip, I'm actually one of my PhD students actually is doing some research on the role of gossip and rumour. Actually, it's been uh, really studied, which is fascinating because, you know, these societies would collapse without gossip and rumour um, and looking at you. So that can be that can be terribly uh, suffocating, you know, and I know. Um, so getting back to the, 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 the lesbian issue, I mean, I can talk to you about two changes around the tensions there. Uh, I mean, as I said, when I first came in 1989 to Sri Lanka, I met with two uh, underground organisations for gay and lesbians, um, and I had to uh, sneak in books through customs. You know, I was absolutely uh, petrified because people didn't get access, didn't have access to material. This is pre-internet, so you know we, there was a life before the internet, um, and and and. And I think they saw that I was like this god from Nibbana because um, I didn't have a child back then, but um, the fact that, you know, you could live a life um, of your choosing, you know. And then, of course, when I did have a child, it was like I was seriously, it was super sainthood uh, because nobody, uh, there were no lesbians at that stage, and I don't think even gay men, there were no lesbians at that stage who had chosen to have a child and I was in a relation, I'm a sole parent now, but I was in a, a, a gay relationship at the time. So I, and, and what's happened is actually over time now is there are quite a few people in, in the LGBT uh, community, in, even in Sri Lanka, who are having children this way. And, and you know, there are movements, I mean, there's a Colombo Pride uh, thing now. So, but there still is this problem. And one of the things I discovered, you know, and Looking back at it, I'm glad I discovered it, although it was terribly painful at the time. Um, I, my last relationship was was with a Sri Lankan woman who um, was uh, from a very powerful family, and, and they had been quite westernised. And I just assumed that they would have kind of uh, internalised some of the Western values, not all of them, because again, we need to be critical of Western values. But what I found in fact is no, it's it's about status and honour and appearance. And they were dreadfully homophobic. Um, they were of the group who, because they had money, were taking their uh, gay kids to the United States to have gender reassignment surgery because they thought it was better to be trans, for example, um, which is really interesting in itself <laughs> in that culture. Um, and they, you know, and, they, and there's a whole other double reality. There's lots of uh, LGBT people who are hiding within heterosexual relationships. Um, but the issue of people watching and snooping, uh, you know, it was highly pressurised. I, I, you know, we did, again, we don't have the research on this. I do wonder how many LGBT people are taken off to mental hospitals uh, because that's the, uh, you know, that's a whole area. So, so it is, it's, it's, it's a bit of, it's an ambivalence, you know, and I think that's okay. I think that's healthy. We need to be able to be engaged in uh, cultural critique um, on both sides. I do not condone uh, practices that are abhorrent. And in fact, I think cultural defences are extremely problematic in some cases, particularly, for example, violence against women. So that was very long winded. <laughs> no, not at all. It's, it's, it's so fascinating. It's so it, you've highlighted such like critical points, and I think this perspective that you have, working across the global north and south, the global minority and majority, and almost trying to work across two different worlds in some ways. It it sounds such like a a challenge, but there's also some really kind of interesting and and fascinating kind of like learnings and knowledges we can gain we can gain from that. And you, you seem to sit on this kind of border between those two worlds, which I think is really exciting in some yeah, ways. Yeah, absolutely. But... absolutely. It's like, I describe it as like the twilight zone. Because actually, <laughs> one, because one of the, um, I think one of the difficult issues personally is that often one doesn't know where one belongs. And, and, and that's magnified by being biracial as well. So, uh, but just on top of that, because you are a stranger and outsider, on, on the question of culture and race between those communities, you know, 
I will never be fully Western. I won't be white acting. I will never be fully Sri Lankan. Um, doesn't matter how much I try, you know, and, and it's about uh, recognising that. And it can be a lonely place, but it also can be a place of thinking at the periphery. And I think that can be good because you can see it from multiple perspectives. And I should just say to you before I shut up again, um, I do need to throw in the Chinese because I'm my daughter's um, of a Chinese background as well. So even though I'm not, um, what that has done is I'm also now kind of uh, increasingly, in fact, immersed into Chinese culture um, and uh, Chinese perceptions of, of the world. And, uh, you know, that's particularly challenging um, in the current environment where there is a, an emergent cold war between America slash West and, um, and China. So, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, I think the the way you articulate that those identities, the also the wider context, the environments, the spaces as well that that you work and, and live in, it really kind of showcases when you're looking at two very different cultures. So you work, you're you're based in Scotland in lovely Dundee, I assume. Or is it in Dundee? Am I right? Yeah, I'm back. I'm sorry. I was I was nodding because you said lovely Dundee. Um, <laughs> From my memories, it was. Yeah, but... <laughs> no, no. Well, the university's great. I actually want to move out of Dundee. I want to move to Glasgow because, because um, actually, it's funny. You know, I, I didn't. I, I left Australia. I didn't. I don't have any great warm fuzzies about Australia. But one of the things that you know you take for granted until you lose it is it's very multicultural, right? And you get people of. Uh, all sorts of people, you know, and um, it's very white Dundee, and that's a a huge shock. Um, so we're we hoping to move to Glasgow, um, <laughs> you know. But can I, problem, can I, yeah. yeah, can I ask you? Because one of the things that you asked me at the start, because you had two questions in that, was mm. about intersectionality. Um, I'm not, I'm very ambivalent about intersectionality. I tell you why, not because of what it is. It's what, what I've noticed in the West, particularly where knowledges have come from America, right, is we get these buzz concepts and buzzwords and they take off a life of their own and, and um, they get bandwagoned and people use them all the time. And, and, and one of the things, and this is the, probably me as the social theorist, I think, well, what are you meaning by that? You know, and, and then it becomes this kind of like a, a sledgehammer, yeah? Um, and one of the things that I see, and and I saw this in a recent paper for, from a, someone who was applying to do a PhD with me. This is from India. Um, and and I was, it stuck out to me because I hadn't seen this language used for a couple of decades. They talked about triple discrimination, right? And that was interesting because, um, I mean, certainly in the 80s, I think intersectionality wasn't a word, but this idea that, you know, um, it, it, how I used to explain it to my students, it's like a brick wall and, and it's like you keep stacking up the layers. So, you know, you could disable black, gay, whatever. And, the, you know, and the, and the bricks get higher and, and kind of, I guess, push you down. And this idea of these um, forces working all at once. And, and of course, now we've got intersectionality and we've got different models. That's the other thing. So I wish when people use intersectionality, they explain which model they're using for a start, because there's actually quite a range and some of these models conflict, you know. Um, and but for me, it's it's well, firstly, you know, as I said to you, I mean, I, I it's my normal. So so it's 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 not um, and, and intersectionality for me is not a problem. I think we still have a problem focus with this, how we use it, you know, these these others, these residual others who don't quite fit into the boxes, you know. Um, but for me, those parts of my identities, um, they come in, they come in and out depending on the context. Do you know what I mean? Um, I mean, some continue, but, and sometimes it's really hard to work out what's going on. Is it disability? Is it race? You know, what the hell's going on? Or is it a combination special? Um, so I think, uh, you know, I think it's it's more nuanced and I think uh, it's an important, I think intersectionality should be centre and front of how we look at diversity as a challenge to the silos approach. You know, I think we need to ditch the silos approach uh, because actually we're all intersectional, inter, 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 intersectional, but it's just a question of degree. 
Yeah, I think you know so. what I mean? Like even white people are. It could be, it could be you know, whiteness and class, whiteness and able-bodiedness. I mean, show me somebody who's not intersectional. It's, it's, it's really good critique of, of intersectionality. And, and you're right, there is this rising, <laughs> as we see with lots of words, often from the sociology literature or kind of dictionary, they're coming in out of buzzwords. And, and this is very much kind of at the forefront of a lot of organizations that I've worked in talking about how do we, what do we do with this intersectionality word? Where do we put it? How do we bring it, how do we bring it to life? And it's, there's this confusion. And, and I feel like um, from the conversations that I had, people get lost in the intersectionality in terms of demographics rather than intersectionality in terms of reflecting structural inequality which is quite a different, it's that moving away from disaggregation of data to what is it actually telling us about the systems and structures people are trying to seek liberation in of some kind? Yeah, yeah, and but, but at the same time, there's a tension because, for example, if you look at the intersection between sustainable development goals and human rights indicators, one of the things that is urgently needed is for disaggregated data. And, um, and in fact, a, a multiplicity of categories. I think the UN suggests 13 groups where we don't do that in the UK. Um, but but you, you, you're absolutely right. And the concern that I have, and this is where I think, you know, people like yourself and myself, um, you know, who are activists, but we also are intellectuals, is to, is to bring closer this intersection between theorisation and, and practice and, and, and activism. Because the danger is, um, is that, you know, and, and I guess I bang on about this more with the word ableism, which, you know, is now used all the time on social media, uh, but people don't explain what it is. And or they say, and this really gets my goat, um, they'll say, oh, ableism is a system that's um, in favour of able-bodied people, you know, and I'm thinking like, well, who are able-bodied people? And, you know, and it's a really problematic definition. But the problem, what I, what I was going to say to you, ableism like intersectionality, if it gets used over and over without precision, it actually loses its meaning. And, and in losing its meaning, it loses its power. And that's my concern that, uh, you know, when governments like the Tories start talking about intersectionality, we know we've got a problem. <laughs> well, you know, my, I, mean, I mean, some people might welcome that, but do you know what I mean? Like I'm thinking about kind of like this dilution of radical terms like community care. When it was used in the 1980s, it was a really radical go get your concept, and now it's like blah blah blah, you know. <laughs> so that was my rave, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's a great one. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a really fast, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to unpick intersectionality, particularly at a time when it's being so politicized and used so much. I wonder though, in terms of thinking about People describe intersectionality as theory, framework, metaphor, prism. There's, so many, there's different approaches to how they synonymize intersectionality. But I do wonder, given that you've done work in, across the UK, in, in, in the West or the Global North, and you've worked in, in Sri Lanka with your posting there as well, how, does the, how, do, how do things like ableism or inequalities or intersections or intersectional thinking or practice how do they translate across two very different cultures or do they not I guess I, I wonder what what does mm. intersectionality look like in the global uh, south uh, I you know. think yeah and you know what this we could spend hours on this this is a really complicated uh issue uh let's unpack it a little bit as much as we can um there is the politics of translation for a start. So, you know, about how uh, concepts in English get translated to um, uh, another language, uh, right, in, in another cultural context. And you can have some problems, right? And also the translation process is not neutral. Um, so with marginal groups, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm picking my words carefully here. With marginal groups, uh, what often happens is they get caught up in the, um, the process of uh, activism and development uh, with NGOs, non-government organisations and global campaign organisations from, from the West. Um, 
And whilst that can be quite good in the sense of providing, you know, folk with resources and, you know, confidence building and mentoring and stuff like that, it runs the danger of bringing in global development agendas, hegemonic, particularly American. I'm not great with Americans, so I'll happily to admit that. Uh, you know, it brings the their politics, their concept of the individual, because a lot of this stuff also goes to this concept of self. Do we have a Western concept of self, of atomistic man, and I'm deliberately using that word, um, the self-possessive person, the autonomous independent who says, I'll do what the hell I want to do. You know, it's a particular nuance of self. It's highly individualised um, versus a, I guess, a, it's quite common, there are different inflections of it in the global south, but what we call a relational self, that sense of um, whilst you are an individual, your, your sense of self, your beingness, the way in which you function in the world is always in relation to the other. Um, you move as a group, as I say, you know, whether it be sharing the bloody telephone or sharing the toilet or sharing the bed, uh, it literally and figuratively uh, is a is a communal communal system, and so when when these overseas groups coming in, I, I, I think you can have a clash. And let me give you one example, um, and it has been shown. So, for example, in Sri Lanka, uh, and and I've been working through this with my PhD student because um, she's working with very marginalised um, communities at the moment, and there was an article on um, uh, transgender people and it, the word transgender was used and then they put the uh, singular word which is nachichi I'm probably not pronouncing it right but anyway um actually it's they, they're not transgender people um, and this is this thing kind of this overlap they are again to, and even me about to say what I'm going to say is using western categories right they are ostensibly gay men uh, who identify as men who wear women's clothes and act a social role of women, right? So, so they're not cross dresses as, as you would understand it in the West. They, they, they carry out the social role of women in a highly gendered society, um, but they have no doubts that they're men and they want to stay men and they want to have sex with men, right? So, so, so this is the problem. And then about introducing an external concept uh, that doesn't make sense. So that so that's the translation issue. Um, the uh, the other issue is, uh, I guess, where it becomes very difficult is this balance again. And we talked about this post Western uh, social theory or post Western sociology. Um, is that people's worldviews are different. So so for example, uh, you know, you see, I, I I'll give you an example with the, the work that I'm doing on China, and I've been doing it for two years now. And um, I'm just starting to publish. It's a bit scary, um, but I've had a crash course in kind of looking at Chinese philosophy and politics and you know international relations. And 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 what there, there was certainly was a trend at one stage to to say, okay, let's go back and look at Chinese ethics, Confucian ethics, and stuff like that, and see how it fits into pre-existing uh, liberal concepts of governance, right? And particularly in the West is this idea of equality. Right, and this is a problem. This is a problem in many uh, non-Western societies because, um, and I'm looking at this, and you know, I, I I think I'm brave because people can kind of get their shotguns out before you've even opened your mouth. Um, like one of the questions I am writing on currently is: Is it possible to have a just, a just hierarchy? Right? It's such an anathema in the West. You know, how can you have hierarchical societies? Are we all equal? You know, but are we all equal? And what do what do you mean by equality? What do we mean by the fact that we've got different um, uh, different capacities, different interests? Um, and and a number of people are looking at this. You know, this idea: uh, uh, is it possible to have a just hierarchy? I mean, the irony in the West is there are hierarchies everywhere. You know, and hierarchies enable. Uh, people to function um, and you know and there's and, and I think this is a good project to look at not saying that just because it's from the you know the global south it's automatically better because this is about the critique issue again we're not just chucking out the western stuff and saying all this other stuff's great it's about well what's involved in this so are we looking at hierarchies where there's reciprocal roles that people's uh, 
what's the word, people's status changes depending on the circumstance that they're in contextually. So it's not, it's not that you're permanently at the bottom or permanently at the top. So I think the other issue is, and I do this with my students, um, Aaron, is to, like in the West, for example, the focus on social justice is very closely related to the idea and the commitment to an equality narrative whatever that means. And I mean, that's an interesting thing in itself. Whereas, for example, from a Confucian perspective, there is this commitment, the, the definition of social justice is in fact is harmony, where mm. people thrive, you know? So, so it's, and, and, and it's, and it's, I guess some of these debates come back, they're not even theoretical debates, they come back to some of the debates I remember in the 1990s about, you know, do we work on feeding people, putting, you know, food in their bellies and housing people and looking at social and economic rights? Or do we just look at, um, you know, which is certainly what a lot of Asian countries were, uh, uh, were arguing, um, or do we look at individual rights, you know, individual rights living in poverty? <laughs> you know, so these are really... I think these are pretty um, issues. So there is a power tension. And one of the concerns that I have is because the American narratives of how they understand individualism, right, and how they understand uh, group minority politics, which come, by the way, from the 14th of Amendment of the US Constitution, which is about protected classes and suspect classes. I mean, most people have no idea how this comes. It comes from a particular constitutional arrangement what I am concerned about, particularly with social media now, um, is that we will have not increased knowledge colonisation. It already happens in, in the UK where, you know, English people can't think for themselves. Everything's so Americanised. In Australia, it's a totally lost project. Um, and and, and it, I'm seeing it now happening in other countries where uh, people are, don't know enough about their own traditions. That's the other thing. But I think there is now a pushback. And I think the Chinese in particular, and to a lesser extent, the Indians, are now pushing back and saying, hang on a minute, we've had these thousand year old traditions. They are changing. They are being reinvigorated with modernity. Um, we need to look at those. And this is something we can offer to the world as well, without the crap in them, of course. Sorry, you're going to have long-winded conversations with me. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's great. It's 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 a lot to to process in some ways as well because yeah. it's not it's not just the 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 content of what you're talking about, but it's the it's this complexity that that surrounds these issues. This and and it, you know you you make reference to a modernizing a more technological world where knowledge saturation is huge. It's hard to find, I mean, well, it's hard to find quality knowledge in some ways sometimes, whether we want to use quality as, as the right word, but um, I, I sometimes disagree with that in some ways, but um, it's, it's hard to kind of know where knowledge is set and I know where to kind of gain some of that information. Yeah, and can I interrupt you on that? Because yeah. it's not just quality, it's about representative knowledge. What is the knowledge that we don't see? Now, I'm not even going to go down the path of fake news, a <laughs> separate issue. But let me give you one simple example, right? China has lifted 750,000 people out of poverty. I'll say it again, 750,000. They've done it in five years, right? And it's been studied. Why aren't we in the West? I mean, Los Angeles is looking like a cesspool. You know, it's like the Calcutta of old. And seriously, it's just uh, we we are having disintegrating democracies in the West. We have this uh, poverty coming out of our ears. Why aren't we? I mean, how amazing that seven hundred and fifty thousand people rural chinese people have been uplifted out of poverty in five years and obviously there is more to be done with those people um but we should be bloody running with a cap in a hand to the chinese to the academics to say how the hell did you do it you know is it is it able to be transferable are there any adjustments why are you and i not seeing that information on social media in the research things you know what I mean? Like, so it's not just that um, is, is is about like trying to make sense of all these bits and pieces and what's quality and what's not quality. There's a whole, you know, it, 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 we know you and I know this anyway. The whole, I mean, the thing is, there's so much we're not seeing from the global south. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's it's very much cloak and dagger sometimes. I think with that knowledge, you don't. We don't. You you have to look for it. You have to dig for it. Um, and even if we look at algorithms of notifications and news feeds, it's going to be situated within the global north and the west, and that's just the way you know you get your news alerts. Yeah, My news yeah, alerts yeah. actually do not come from the global south. You know, I, the I've tried to break that algorithm on multiple yeah. occasions. Oh, but, yeah. well, tell me, well, tell me how you can do it because you know when you think about it, what is the major two global social challenges today? Climate change and poverty, mm. right? And then, and so, 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 if somebody has, and and I'm, I, and that's why I picked out that example. If somebody has come up with a blueprint, maybe it might not work outside of China, right? But seriously, there's something quite corrupt and suspicious. Are we? Would we rather hang on to our international agendas about? Because I think, for me, my own view on this, it's about well. How well has capitalism functioned? How well has liberalism functioned? You know, like it's not done it. It's created more poverty. Uh, it's certainly created global wars. Um, so, you know, it, it, it brings that into uh, contention, doesn't it? Yeah. And should, activists be, and should activists, who are meant to be progressive, by the way, instead of towing the line, why aren't activists uh, picking this up, you know? So if we can find like like if we can find because I worked on poverty alleviation projects when I had hair and when I was younger and whatever but um um you know if someone came to me then and said we we've got an example that poverty can be alleviated in five years I would have been grabbing that because you know people are hurting and as an activist committed to alleviating suffering I would want to have a look at that and so we as a progressive so-called progressive movements why aren't we doing this we're all so encaged it's not just the Donald Trumps of the world yeah I think having having worked in across different sectors in government and the third sector myself and worked on similar like poverty allevi alleviating projects and programs as well impact is, is sometimes shifted away from the humanitarian issue itself is shifted towards impact in terms of visibility of the work we're doing rather than the oh, yeah. impact uh, and i think it gets lost in that kind of business cycle <laughs> you know or, or the profiteering of the, the profiting within industry. charities it's an industry profit. yeah absolutely it's, it's, it's an industry and i've got yeah. a, I, I haven't got the book here otherwise i'd hold it up there's a really interesting study i'll send it to you it's by an um a woman in the UK. She's mm. looked at. Uh, uh, it's a. It's a, She's an anthropologist, right? She's looked at um, an outlaw caste in um, uh, a part of India, right? And and um, you know, and and she looks at the issue of hierarchy. But one of the things is, they say a couple of things that talk about what you're saying here. Um, you know, is that the NGOs and the kind of uh, big big men come into areas and they want to push their own agenda and it's the equality agenda and it's terribly patronizing saying you know we want to uplift these people and make them more equal blah 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 right you get the gist and they're the ones that have the ha happy snaps and they also the gatekeepers in terms of people being able to access them but what she was saying when she interviewed and lived with some of these um outlaw actually they're like a gang cast they used to the robber cast i think they were called under the old uh, raj system and what she was is that most of people actually they don't want equality they're not interested in it what they actually want in terms of their own self-development and self-development and their own peacefulness is they actually want a return to the hierarchical patronage system you know and that can totally floor people because what was there in that system there was always someone looking after you right I, you kiss mine i kiss yours and, and 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 everybody had a social role and a place right and and, and it's very hard for the western mindset to get its head around this, uh, whereas now the, the rug has been pulled, yeah, under this kind of equality narrative, and these people have been totally abandoned. Um, but it looks good on paper, doesn't it, Aaron? I mean, these people are kind of, you know, ticking boxes and all these global indexes. And, um, and I was going to say, and the other thing is my Sri Lankan student, one thing that we've been talking about, and he's working in a uh, market area with very, very, um, uh, I wouldn't say low caste, but people very on the edge, right? Um, and 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 even the progressive LGBT uh, and some of the NGOs, they won't work with those people. She was really shocked. 
I mean, why are you working with these people? You know, they're scary people. So I think it's really interesting, the whole politics of intervention. Um, and, and, you know, I think there needs to be a great reckoning. People like you and I will open up our mouths um, and probably won't be very popular with this because I think there is, a, you know, people need to look at what is the investment in prog progressive activism and politics. And are you really... Are you really interested in the hearts and the lives of the people who are at the bottom of society? You know? Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's such a huge area. And I know we've only really scratched the surface of a lot of these things. But I think coming from this conversation, I, it, it's clear that intersectionality means this is something that has always been in your life, even before the word came about, yeah. as, it, as we know it today. And um there's there's these tensions between identities behaviors um your histories and legacies and things they've all played a role and they've all sometimes been in parallel sometimes have not worked together and then in so in, in different ways as well but it's, it's interesting how that's transformed into your work and how you've brought that into kind of an activist approach i think what's, what's kind of reflective as well is that it's so difficult it's so complicated in some ways and i think we have to embrace that chaos with, with what comes with this <laughs> particularly in, a, in an international setting and we've talked a bit about globalized worlds and this move this obsession about having global kpis global frameworks and this one framework for the one and it's just like people let it go <laughs> just, well i think i think i think what no. we're happening we're about in you know this this whole what they call the new cold war that's potentially imminent is actually a battle over um uh, the, the, the narrative and the way in which you know do we believe in kind of world mutual communities um mm. or do we believe in separate nation states but um you know so that so so uh, you know these are, are are really important issues and then the same if you're in the thick of it um you know i think um what what i would like to see out of intersectionality is that we can kind of mainstream it it's not just a uh a, a concept that involves marginality i think um because i still think we we often still have a problem focus you know when we when we view diversity so and intersectionality is part of it i think um so it's i and and you know we're getting slow slow changes that are that, that are happening but i was going to say just in, in concluding i mean i don't know about you but i feel i feel i i feel i have a great burden to carry uh because um I have been privileged with a Western education. Um, I'm not saying that if I was educated elsewhere, I, I wouldn't be privileged, but we do know that speaking English and um, uh, being educated in the West does give you in the current power dynamics a head start. So I feel a real burden um, uh, to make sure that I use it for, for good and to use it to open up networks and spaces for, people who've been excluded and you know it's 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 hard it's it's hard because sometimes um you know it, it, uh, just to finish like you know i want things to happen quickly and you know sri lankans have this thing where if it takes one hour it takes two hours to have a deliberation and a third hour to have a wrap up about it like it's um uh, there's a disorganization with it and that can be quite um quite frustrating and you don't want to impose on them but i do feel that uh, people like you and myself do have a burden and um to try and bring these diverse realities in conversation or at least in dialogue. No, thank you so much for that. I was going to ask for your final thoughts and take home message, but am I right in assuming that might have been your, yeah. <laughs> your kind of last your last reflection for the conversation? So it's been such a wonderful time speaking with you. I feel like we've just spoken about the world in about fifth and a half an hour <laughs> in in some ways as much as we can. So just want to say thank you so much for your time um and yeah this has been such a great conversation so yeah thanks again for for joining